<laughs> uh, my name is Josh Cheney. I'm a deputy with the Carson City Sheriff's Office, uh, currently assigned to the Special Enforcement Team. Um, been doing this job for a little over a year right now, so I'm still really new at it. Um, my area of expertise lies elsewhere. Um, prescription drugs is something that we get to see after everything has gone on. Um, we're dealing with it more in the street, but because we are a little bit more readily available than NDI and Trinet is, you guys might reach out to us first, so we're probably going to be the ones responding. Um, I have a little bit of experience with prescription drugs, but like I said, mine's, my forte is more of the signs and symptoms and what happens after they've gotten them. So uh, we're going to talk about a couple of those things tonight, uh, more from the street side than the investigation side and what we're seeing, how we're seeing things. So if you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to call out. <clears throat> and my boss is here, so laugh at my jokes, that way I you know, get a good eval. <clears throat> so most prescription, dr prescription drugs, especially pain meds, fall under narcotic analgesics. In my world, with the DRE side, that's opium-based medications, just like heroin. Um, they're highly addictive and people get hooked on them very, very easily and detox from them very, very quickly. We see, unfortunately, um, I spent a little bit of time in the military. Unfortunately, we have a large section of our veteran community that has been coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan that were just thrown prescription pills when they got back by the VA. And it's no fault of anybody, it's just how they dealt with it when they got back. I have several friends that were blown up in Iraq and Afghanistan who luckily didn't become addicted to prescription pain pills, but we are seeing a very uh, a a rise with the prescription pain pills from veterans and then that leads to the heroin side like Lieutenant Razor hit on earlier tonight. So everybody's pretty much medicated now from my seven eight year old daughter who takes ADHD medication to the lady down the street because she can't handle whatever she's got Xanax she's got this she's got that to the guy that sits on the street corner we're all m medicated in one way or another. And what Josh talks about the medication and so forth, and, and the lieutenant touched about this, is that we're seeing people who have uh, surgeries on their knees and so forth, and then they're driving. So we're also seeing it that they're driving under the influence. So just because a doctor prescribes it to you, if you're under the influence and you're impaired while you're driving, this is where we see those soccer moms type of things. They're taking Xanax. They, they can't handle the, the soccer game or their kids after school, so they'll take a couple Xanax. Well, when they're weaving all over the road, that's where they come in contact with us. So same thing, just because a doctor's prescribing it and it says on, on the bottle, take two a day, two every eight hours, and don't operate heavy machinery, a car's heavy machinery. So people think it's a dump truck or an 18-wheeler. It, it, it falls under your vehicles also. So that's where you're gonna see us on the street following up on those. That's where the DRE comes in is the drug recognition experts. They will come in and be able to evaluate a person to, to show their impairment while they're driving. Because these are the people that are driving around Carson City, Douglas County, and in the state, driving impaired just because a doctor prescribed it doesn't mean that it's okay for them to drive. Uh, to go a little review of what was said earlier, the statements when I used to do these investigations when I was a detective, statements are important. People don't want to get involved. While you guys are here today, we appreciate you guys showing up, but there's only so much we can do. I would go into pharmacy sometimes and nobody would want to fill out a statement. Without that, we got nothing. The, the road for us stops right there. I have nothing to present to the district attorney's office. So this is where you guys have to get involved. This is where we appreciate you guys showing up today. But without you guys in this room, we're dead in the water. If you guys don't call us, there's nothing for us to follow up on. So we need you guys to be our eyes and our, and, uh, and our ears when this stuff's happening because it's happening right in front of you. Um, the people that come into your pharmacies, they have their hat real, real way down. They got their hoods on and so forth. If, if it's not 10 below, your, guy, your guys' stores are pretty warm. They're, they're trying to hide their identity. They, they don't want that camera to get that good profile. They're coming in your stores with a hat and some sunglasses on. I don't think the fluorescent lights in your guys' stores are that bright that they're going to need sunglasses. Those are the ones we want you to, the hair on the back of your neck should go up and we want you to slow down and go, why is, why is this being presented? No difference in the doctor's signs and symptoms, runny nose, hay fever, you probably have a cold. You guys as pharmacists, pharmacy techs, why is this guy coming in with his sunglasses? I've never seen him before. He doesn't have an account at, my, at the pharmacy. He's a new recipient. Or 
it's somebody's brother picking up their brother's prescription because he just got out of the hospital. Those are the ones we want you to really slow down. It's not a regular customer and go, well, why is this presenting it that way? Why are the sunglasses? Why is the hat down? Why is the sweatshirt? Somebody's smiling because they've probably seen that. So that's what we're talking about. These are the signs and symptoms that we want you to look at. No different than a doctor sees, uh, you know, runny nose and all that. Why is this person trying to conceal their identity? Why is their ID bent and crinkled up? Well, you can't read the numbers, uh, those types of things. If you guys can make a color copy of their driver's license, that's better because the black and white, their picture's gone on half, on half of them. Look at it. Look at it and go, is this something that I'm gonna be able to give to one of the investigators later to give to a jury if it goes that far? Well, if it's black and white, it's really hard to say that that was a person, especially if they're concealing their identity with sunglasses, hats, and all those types of things. I mean, you can't even go into 7-Eleven and you, have to ha you can't have a hood on anymore. Well, now you guys are giving somebody a controlled substance. Shouldn't they have to be able to, you, could, you should be able to see who they are? You, you should. The Call 7 investigators hearing from parents who say their children are addicted to drugs, drugs they're getting from their doctors. Call 7 investigator Teresa Marchetta looking into the staggering trend in Colorado. We're talking about oxycodone. You may know it as oxycontin or just oxy, an opiate used to control extreme pain, usually reserved for cancer or hospice patients. But teens and others are getting their hands on it at an alarming rate. And law enforcement says when it comes to doctors who prescribe it, there's little they can do about it. It's almost like it's a dream. It's almost well, not a dream, it's like a nightmare. It's not something that you ever, you know, raising your kids, you don't ever imagine them growing up to be a drug addict. When Christy Lambrecht went to her son's home to confront him about his prescription drug addiction, among the dozens of pill bottles, she found a note. Something about him having a back injury from football, um, which my son never played football. Her son played basketball, a happy teen, she says, who told her he tried Oxy once and was hooked. But at that point, he came out and told me he was smoking approximately 30 pills a day. Oxycodone is an opiate, a prescription pain medicine used for short periods of time post-surgery or in cases of extreme pain or organ failure, and physicians know it's extremely addictive. Lambrecht and her family had tried professional intervention, pleading with their son to get help, ultimately calling police. They had found I don't even, there was so much medication, but they were all prescription bottles from Dr. Drennan. The quantity, and it was like 380 oxycodones, 30 milligrams, and... Um, For each bottle? Each bottle. Lambrecht can't comprehend how her son could get a prescription, let alone the maximum strength available. A lot of them were called in. He didn't even have to go to the doctor. He's never had an MRI, he's never had a CAT scan. He's never had any of those things from this doctor. We heard from other parents with similar stories, some naming Dr. Daniel Drennan as the source of the prescriptions. While they couldn't provide us proof, we asked Dr. Drennan how this could happen. We had parents, two parents actually say that you, their kids had gotten prescriptions from you. Mm -hmm. Has that happened? Are you aware of that? I have a lot of patients that come through my clinic. He says pain management is a tricky business. But a lot of patients aren't there for the right reason. They lie to me and they tell me incorrect information. And that physicians in the field agree oxycodone is overprescribed. When a patient re is referred in to my clinic for a consultation, 95% of patients are already on high dose opiates. Drennan says he only sees patients referred to him and works to reduce their oxydoses, transitioning to other therapies whenever possible. A number of these younger patients, it's obvious that they have addiction issues. I could turn them away from me. They're going to go find another physician to go take advantage of. Drennan tells me he's been a victim too. Have your prescriptions I have had ever that issue. Absolutely. been falsified or Absolutely. fraudulently used? One of the cases that we were involved in, they had one of my copies of my prescription. They found 300 copies in that patient's apartment with a laser printer. We are ranking number two in the nation right now with prescription drug abuse. Uh, much higher than the national average. You'd call it a crisis. It, it's absolutely a crisis. This is a this is a huge problem. Sergeant Jim Gerhart with the North Metro Drug Task Force says many addicts get oxy right out of the medicine cabinets of their family and friends, but we have leads right now on other physicians that are prescribing in a very suspicious manner. In Colorado, Gerhardt says the penalties for physicians caught abusing their prescription writing authority are administrative, related to licensing, not criminal. Right now, um, doctors can be opportunists and they can write a lot of prescriptions and really not have much sanction. That's shocking. Shocked me too. Um, to be honest with you, I thought for sure there would be some 
statute on our book that would uh, allow us to deal with that issue. And he says the oxy problem is leading to an even bigger one. Our heroin seizures and our heroin overdoses are going through the roof right now as well. The heroin's cheaper. At $25 or more per pill, Gerhardt says many addicts are turning to heroin. Christy Lambrecht's son is one of them. Seeing him the way he was, I mean, my son's like six foot five and he was down to about 130 pounds. So I love my son and I don't want him to die. Dr. Drennan says he has started giving all new patients urinalysis to verify what drugs and doses they're on. Colorado has had a prescription drug monitoring database since 2007 to track prescriptions of drugs like oxycodone. But neither doctors nor pharmacies are required to check it before giving out prescriptions. Incredible story. Teresa, thanks very much. So uh, basically what the video was was a YouTube video and it was a uh, news channel um, or a channel news channel doing an investigation and an interview with parents and people like that were uh, that are addicted to prescription pain pills. Uh, these people are not using them in the traditional sense. They're not taking them with water. They're not taking them six day time, eight hours at a time. You know, in between four to six hours at a time, whatever. They're crushing them up and they're snorting them. They're putting them in needles and they're injecting them. And if you guys have people coming in that want bigger needles, start asking questions because they can't shoot prescription pain pills with a small gauge needle. They have to have a larger gauge needle because it doesn't break down as as nicely as your meth and your heroin does because of the different cutting agents. So if somebody comes in and they get a, a pain pill prescription filled and they want a large gauge needle, that should probably start setting some alarms off <clears throat> because they're not gonna be doing what they need to do with it. Um, they use the same needles over and over again. That's why a lot of them are getting diseases and they're getting all kinds of nasty marks on them. Um, if anybody's ever seen somebody that looks like they've had a cigarette burned onto their skin and there's pock marks all over their arms and stuff like that, especially near their veins, that is from prescription pain pills because the skin around the, um, the arm is actually decaying and it's eating away at it. So it's gonna look like a cigarette burn. So start paying attention to people that come in like that. Um, if they, especially, again, if they start asking for the bigger gauge needles, things like that. If everybody didn't know, you can have a hypodermic device in Nevada now and it's no longer a crime. I can't arrest on it unless there's something in there that I can test. So if they look like they put cigarettes out all over their face and they got their hoods and their sunglasses, <laughs> In our job, we call that a clue. <laughs> okay, so there's a test later, right? You got a test, so that's one of the tw test questions. So um, again, start paying attention to these different signs. This is the stuff that we look for. Um, if they come in and they say they're a diabetic and they need to pick up needles or something like that, not a huge deal, but I like to start quizzing people and asking them, well, what type of diabetes do you have? They're gonna know that. What type of insulin do you have? When you ask somebody what type of insulin do they take and they sit there and go da, 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 that's a clue and we like to start asking a little bit more questions about it. I don't know what you guys are seeing um, or if you're seeing anything like that, but they're getting their needles from someplace. Has everybody heard of the Hopes Clinic in Reno? Does everybody know what that is? Does anybody not know what that is? Raise your hand. The Hopes Clinic is a needle exchange in Reno. They give free needles to addicts and they'll take their used needles. Now, from what I've been told by some of my Reno PD counterparts that I teach DRE with, they actually have a room that they can shoot up in and they will help them do it so that way they can hit a vein. I don't know how true it is because I haven't seen it, I haven't actually looked into it myself, but it's a way for them to get clean needles and they don't have to use the same needles over and over again. And that's more for your methamphetamine and heroin and stuff. But again, they're using the, the needles to get the prescription drugs. So they're not using it in the traditional sense. So as far as investigating prescription drugs, once you have somebody that comes in with a police report and their pills get lost three times a month, you should probably call us. Because what they're doing is they're trying to um, start a paper trail so they can show, oh yeah, my pills were stolen, but I don't know who it was from. I've had a lot of people in my house, this, that, and the other. I don't necessarily what I know what's going on. They're probably abusing those prescription pain pills or the, their prescription medications, okay? So police reports, uh, if you start seeing a lot of them, start asking questions, start following up with the sheriff's office or uh, NHP if they happen to take the report or whoever it is that took the report. If you see somebody that comes from Reno with a Reno police report to file a prescription or to get a prescription filled in Carson, 
probably a red flag. You might want to start looking into that kind of stuff because they're going to file it with one agency and go to a different county or different place where that agency is not going to be and try and get that prescription filled because they don't want you to have to call them. You guys can call Reno PD, Sparks PD, Washoe County and you can check to see if this person has made any other reports in the last month. That's public information. And a lot of times when these prescriptions come in, it's after five, so you guys can't call the doctor. So when you see that influx after five o'clock of, once again, you guys start seeing these clues, there's a reason they're coming in after five o'clock because they know you can't call and confirm with, with the doctor that, hey, I, just, I did write 360 pills on there. Uh, so it's not a mistake that they're coming in after five o'clock or on the weekends. And everybody knows that most doctors, especially if they go to an ER, then they're only going to get a prescription for a small amount until they can go see their primary care physician or whatever it is, and then they're going to get the actual prescription filled later on. So if they come in from the ER, especially the ER, and they have a, a very large prescription, start asking questions or call us and we'll start asking the questions. Uh, more than one doctor, we went over that doctor shopping. They're going to go around to anybody that they can get to try and get these prescription pain pills. They're going to go to this person, they're going to go to this person, they're going to go to this person. <clears throat> Just fill the prescription and more pills are gone than should be. That's going to be more for me and uh, people out on the street. But uh, what they'll do is they'll get a prescription filled today and they'll take like 10 me uh, pain medications or 10 of that prescription pill and then when we run into them there's all these pills missing and they have a, uh, an excuse for why they're missing oh well you know I gave them to this person well the NRS for sales states in it if you give somebody something if I give if I were to come over to you and I were to give you a pill that's mine and it's not yours that is sales that's giving it away to somebody I can arrest them for sales at that point all right so just think again start thinking about all this other stuff um, one case I worked when I was in detectives was an overdose and so we backtracked the pills to grandma. So grandma was receiving 360 pills a month. She was supposed to take 12 a day. Grandma for me kept a journal which was great when I did a search one on her house. She had over 1200 pills in her house stockpiled in case she needed them one day. So what would happen is her grandson and family members would come over because they knew grandma had a stockpile of pain medication and they'd say, grandma, my back hurts. She'd give him 20, she'd give him 30 kind of thing. So it built a tolerance for these kids. It, he was actually, I think, 22 years old who overdosed was he went drinking and took a handful and he died and he got them from grandma. So it's, it's, it's the prescription, it's the cabinets, the drug cabinets and so forth. People have knee surgeries. You know, parents will see kids at the high school with these pills. Parent has a knee surgery, he gets 90 Vicodin. He takes him for the first week because he has a lot of pain. Well, now he has 70 left. Well, they keep them in the drug cabinets because I might have pain six months from now, a year from now, three years from now. So they don't want to get rid of them. Well, the day they go get that pill three years later, are they going to remember that they left 12 or that there were 70 in there? So this is where we're seeing it all from the high school. Um, this is why they have the prescription drug roundups. That's where it's important to get these medications off because they're just sitting in these cabinets. Kids are having parties at their parents' house during, when they're on vacation and these pills come up missing. He stepped on my thunder because that's like in the next slide. So appreciate that. <laughs> So do doctors break the laws? This video on, on YouTube was basically from um, the prescription pill roundup in Joe's West Ford. It was like a minute long. It basically just talked about how the doctor that was prescribing the pills caused a couple deaths. This is Channel 2 News, coverage you can count on. A joint task force that included the FBI and DEA raided Jones West Ford and the home of Richard West Jr. this morning. Crime beat tops Channel 2 News at 5 o'clock. Well, it's a story we broke on our app just this morning, and we've been following the developments all day long for you. Good evening. I'm Kristen Remington. And I'm Landon Miller. Thank you for joining us tonight. Well, it all happened after search and arrest warrants were issued, resulting in multiple arrests. Paul Nelson joins us live right now at Jones West Ford with more on this developing story. Paul. Yeah, Landon, it was a little before 10 o'clock this morning when local, state, and federal agencies swarmed this car dealership. Now, witnesses tell us everything happened very quickly and with multiple people taken into custody. Federal agents wasted little time entering into the buildings at Jones West Ford. One customer says the agents went in through every entrance and calmly ordered everyone to the front of the building. He says customers and some employees were removed within about five minutes while the operation was being executed. 
The U.S. Attorney's Office has not confirmed who was arrested or the reason, but witnesses inside the building say Richard West Jr., shown here in a previous story, was led away in handcuffs. Meanwhile, another warrant was issued at West Jr.'s home in South Reno. More than a dozen cars driven by federal agents surrounded the property while the search was being conducted. Other agencies that assisted in the operation were the Reno Police Department, Washoe County Sheriff's Office, ATF, Homeland Security, and the Nevada Department of Public Safety Investigation Division. Jones West Ford was closed for a couple hours while the raid was going on. Now, we did try to get a comment from the business, but so far, they're not releasing any statements. Covering Crime Beat Live, Paul Nelson, Channel 2 News. All right, Paul, thanks for working on that story all day for us. And today we also spoke with the next door neighbor of Richard West Jr. about his home being raided. Um, actually, my daughter called me and said, what's going on? So I had no idea. And she goes, there's cops and FBI and newscast around surrounding our house. So I was a little worried when I came home to see how my daughter was doing. Sylvia says she has never seen a scene like this in the time she's lived there. This is the South Reno neighborhood she's talking about and was surprised to hear of this investigation. With his wife and his kids and but I mean, like I said, they're really good neighbors because we're hardly they're very quiet. They're by themselves and we just say hi, bye and call every once in a while. But it's not like they're great neighbors. I've never had any problems with them at all. There are doctors that prescribe medication that aren't supposed to or they're prescribing too much. On that note, they're over prescribing. If you see somebody that has chronic sprained ankles, and I wish I was kidding when I said that because we actually had somebody that said I have chronic sprained ankles, and I'll tell you the story here in a minute. <coughs> you um, laugh, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to over prescribe them. They're going to give them something like Oxycontin, Oxycodone, Vicodin, Percocet, whatever, and it's a sprained ankle and there's like a hundred pills in there. Do they really need that? I don't know. I'm not a doctor. That's why I, I didn't go to medical school. I almost barely graduated from high school. <laughs> so they're going to over prescribe the pain medications. Doctors who don't normally give pain meds start giving them out in abundance. I went to a uh, child sex trafficking class in Las Vegas last week and one of the presenters was uh, an internet crimes against child inv investigator. Before that he worked prescription pain pills. What he was saying and what he, would, he saw and it tied into the class was there was a doctor that was prescribing, a pediatrician that was prescribing a lot of pain medication to 15, 16, 17 year old male juveniles. The males were going getting the prescriptions filled and what he had seen in the past is the males are bringing him back to the doctor because he doesn't want to prescribe them to himself and he's the one abusing them. In this case, he was sexually assaulting the 16, 17, 15, 16, 17 year old male juveniles and getting them hooked on pain pills and they were in jail because they now were burglarizing and robbing and doing all this other stuff so they'd get their fix and they moved on to heroin. So, I personally have never seen it, but if you see a pediatrician or you guys know what doctors prescribe what, if they start prescribing an overabundance of pain medication, start seeing red flags because the doctor might be the actual one that's, per, that's uh, abusing the prescription pain pills. And he doesn't want to use his DEA number to prescribe them to himself because he knows that can be traced back to him. So he's going to prescribe them to somebody else. Uh, people are insistent for name brands. What we've seen on my level is our prescription pill users don't want the off-brand prescription pills. They want the, the Vicodin, they want the Oxys, they want the Percocets, and they're gonna ask specifically for that. When I go to the pharmacist, my insurance is not the greatest in the world, so I ask for the generic because I only wanna pay the $3 instead of the $70 that it costs for the actual name brand prescription. So if you get people asking for the name brand prescription, not always all the time gonna be abusing, but that's it's something to think about. So why are they gaining popularity? Prescriptions are harder to detect in drug tests. Unless you know exactly what drug combination you're looking at, you can't necessarily test for that drug combination. Oxycontin, oxycodone, all that stuff is easy because it's opiate based. So you're looking for opioids. Anything else, it's kind of iffy. Xanax, all those things are an actual depressant, which you guys all know. So you're gonna have to test for different things. All right, so you actually have to have that prescription if I'm going to do a drug test on somebody, a urinalysis or a blood test. And the blood tests, just so you guys know, the prosecutors are very, they're very, very expensive and they have to send it to Texas, I want to say. 
and it's like upwards in the thousands of dollars to get it back. So the prosecutors, the DAs, city attorneys, whatever, they don't like sending that test out unless there's been a death or a DUI causing substantial bodily harm or death. They're easy to steal from their parents and grandparents. Parents and grandparents are becoming kid, these juveniles drug dealers. High school, middle school, as young as elementary school are using prescription pain meds. Like I said, I've got an eight year, eight year old little girl. I specifically, she, has, she was recently diagnosed with ADHD and I specifically asked for a non-amphetamine based medication because I was ADHD grown up. I had Ritalin and I hated the way it made me feel. I didn't want to take her personality away and tamp that down and I really didn't want to give her any amphetamines. So I specifically requested something without amphetamines in it. So we have something that, that we're trying out and it's working out really well. A lot of people don't know that. They don't know their homework going into this stuff. They just have a kid that's acting out and now they want to medicate him and try and, well, he's screwing around. He's seven, okay? Let him be a kid, <laughs> shut up. So they're easy to steal from parents and grandparents. We're our own worst enemy in that. Um, I have prescription pain pills from, I don't, my wife had a C-section, so there's prescription pain pills in my medicine cabinet from when she had a C-section in 2010. We've since gotten rid of them, put them in the prescription pill roundup, but how many people actually get rid of their prescriptions? They put them in the pain med or their uh, medicine cabinet and they're like, oh, I'm gonna, I forgot about it, whatever. Pain medication is used to dull the pain. It's not used to completely take it away. And a lot of these people are trying to get that pain completely gone. That's the point. That's the whole reason they get hooked on them. And they move generally move on to something stronger, such as heroin. They're easily overlooked. If I go into the high school right now, or if I go into a middle school, or if I go someplace else, and I were to see a prescription pain pill, am I really going to take that much time to look at it? I am, because that's what my job is. But if a teacher sees that, are they really going to question that? Well, I might get in trouble if I ask them what they're taking this prescription for. I don't really know if it is a prescription. Is it illegal? Can they have it? That's why a lot of juveniles, high school age especially, are getting their prescription pain pills or their prescription medications and they're taking them with them to school and they're getting high in the back of the classroom. Just recently we had, I want to say seven, do you remember uh, people that went down at the high school? I want to say seven, I'm not 100%, but there was in one day there was at least four that were taken, they called it triple C, and it was basically just a, a cold medication, and they took like 16 pills, and, they over, and it was all over the counter medication, and they all started vomiting, passed out, and all this stuff, and the fire department had to come show up to start taking them to the hospital. Well, what they didn't say was the fire department was looking at this as a mass casualty event. There was four people that passed out the fire chiefs and the bigwoods in the fire department are going, what the heck is going on? We need to go over there, we need to shut the school down, we need to do this, we need to start doing this, 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 and this. They thought it was something else. And they were gonna treat it as a mass casualty event. They didn't realize that at the high school, these juveniles, these, these uh, students at the school, didn't realize that until after the fact. And now, it, we're still seeing it more and more. It's not as big as it was, but we're getting onesies and twosies here and there. So unfortunately, it's all prescription based or over the counter medications so they can have it. We're working on trying to educate the high school, educate the fire department, edu educate the school district on you guys need to start asking these questions. It's not a violation of law for you to ask them what they're taking prescription pain pills for. Are you, do they have a prescription? All this other stuff. It's not something that you can't not ask. Um, also, what we've seen is what they'll do is they'll take the prescription pain pills and they'll put them in a uh, Motrin or an ibuprofen bottle and they'll shake the bottle up. There's only three pills in there, now I have to go through a whole bottle of, a Costco sized bottle of ibuprofen versus the actual prescription pain pill. So now we have to dump all the, pain, the, the uh, medication out and we got to go through it hand, uh, by hand. Anytime I see a pain or a uh, bottle, I open it up, I look through it, whether we're looking in a car or whatever, and then I look at the um, drugs.com, uh, I have a pill identifier that I use on my phone because now I can just print that off and I can attach it to my case file. And I've already identified everything about it. So that's what I do, not everybody does that. Uh, they can sell them, like Lieutenant Razor was talking about, they go for approximately a dollar a milligram depending on where you're at. Um, right now, the last person we saw with prescription pills, they were saying it was about a dollar, dollar fifty, just depends on what it is and how many, how many milligrams. 
Uh, it's the precursor for heroin. We've talked about that all night long because it's the opium-based medication. They're gonna start using the f every four to six hours. Then they're gonna be taken off of it. Remember what I was telling you guys about our veteran community and being thrown all this stuff at them for pain pills? Well, they got hooked on them and then they cut them off cold turkey. They didn't have a plan to wean them off of those medications. So they move on to heroin. Not all, but some move on to heroin. When they move on to the heroin, it's just like a prescription pain pill. What does Vicodin, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, Percocet say on the bottle? Take every, how many hours? Four to six hours is needed by, or for pain, right? Heroin is almost exactly the same way. You get a heroin user that's using regularly, and it's not just to maintain, and by maintain, he's using maybe a tenth of a gram a day, maybe two tenths of a gram a day, or a point. You get somebody that's really into heroin, they're gonna be using every four to six hours because it's opium based and they're gonna start detoxing from it and they get sick. It's the same thing with the prescription pain pills. And they know when they're gonna get sick. That's one of the questions we ask them. When are you gonna get sick in about two hours? So. And, and it's down to the minute. I mean, these guys are good. So I didn't add it. I didn't add it in here because we, I wasn't sure where we were gonna be at for time. We're gonna go over, I'm gonna go over a little bit of prescription marijuana or the legal, the medical marijuana stuff. If anybody has any questions, please ask because we're gonna start seeing it more and more. Everybody knows there's a dispensary coming into Carson City, correct? You're gonna start seeing prescriptions for medical marijuana. Maybe not you guys, but we're, it, it's gonna be out there, okay? So the chronic sprained ankle. We, uh, Sergeant Gonzalez stopped a car coming down from South Lake Tahoe and pulled behind the kid. 18 year old gets out can smell an odor of marijuana coming from the vehicle. He says, oh, I've got my California medical marijuana card. Well, we don't honor California medical marijuana cards. There's some stuff in place that you can get it honored, but right now, no. So Sergeant Gonzalez is like, well, well, okay, cool. Where's your marijuana at? Yeah, it's in the glove box. All right, so we pull him out, start going through a bunch of stuff. Sergeant Gonzalez asks him, what is your medical condition? You're 18 years old. What, what do you need medical marijuana for? Is there like trauma or is there, what, what happened? At about, that, at about that point, he started laughing. So I knew something was up. When he stopped laughing, because he was laughing uncontrollably, he said, I have chronic sprained ankles. <laughs> that, that's what he said. That's how he got his medical marijuana card. So there is medical marijuana in the state of Nevada, in case anybody didn't know. There's a whole process. You have to go to get it. You have to put in an application. You have to see a doctor. You have to do all this other stuff, and then you can buy it. Um, we're going to have a grow facility in Carson, and I want to say we're going to have three dispensaries in our area. Yeah, um, it's, it's regulated and all that stuff. Um, there, are, there are studies that show medicinal purposes for medical marijuana. Um, there's a lot of other stuff out there that they could take, but we're not going to get into that. The problem with medical marijuana, prescription drugs, tr uh, alcohol, cocaine, heroin, meth, people get in cars and drive after taking it. Marijuana can stay in your system. The active ingredient, the active uh, Delta 9 THC can stay in your system for up to 12 hours, and that's what's actually getting you high. They're still gonna exhibit, depending on their body type and a bunch of other stuff, they're gonna still exhibit signs up to 12 hours after that. Prescription drugs, same thing. So it's an issue because we're seeing more and more prescription drug DUIs, marijuana DUIs, medical marijuana DUIs, things like that. So if you guys have people that come into your pharmacy and they start asking questions about the medical marijuana program or whatever it is they're gonna do, you just need to refer them to a doctor because as far as I know, you shouldn't be prescribing it anyway. Is that correct? I mean, correct. if I'm wrong, then let me know. And if you see people coming in lethargic, you know, no different than you guys, if you guys were running a cash register and somebody came in to buy a case of beer and you smell alcohol and they can't even pull the money out of their wallet. If you guys somebody coming to fill a prescription and you don't smell alcohol but you can't have a coherent conversation with them and they're by themselves, most likely they're going to get in a car. Call us too. I mean, people call for DUI. That, that is a driving under, under the influence, whether it's alcohol or it's, it's, other, it's other types of medication. Um, this is our contact information. We work the streets. So if you guys get a prescription, um, give us a call. Call dispatch, said, hey, I, I need the set team to come down here. This is what, what I have going on right now. Or we got this phone call. A lot of these prescriptions get phoned in and it just doesn't sound like the right nurse or the right doctor and it's after five o'clock. Call us, 
We'll be there when somebody comes pick up the prescription. We'll say hi, because if you get known as that you call the cops, they're gonna go somewhere else. You don't wanna be known as that, as that mark. The number, go ahead. The number at the bottom is Sergeant Gonzalez's direct office phone number.